a brand new week and mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about a controversial topic and I'll, I'll, I'll mention controversy uh, and there's an astronomer's name attached to this contro controversy and again when you see people talking about uh, they don't like the expanding universe model because of this this astronomer's name comes up quite often and this is Halton Arp and yeah. Halton, Halton Arp was a very well-known astronomer and he claimed to have discovered something which he claimed showed that the, the Big Bang expanding space version of the universe is wrong. And this is this notion of anomalous redshift. So, Luke, what is an anomalous redshift? An anomalous redshift, yeah. So, Halton Arp, he, he, the first thing to say, he's like, he was a genuine astronomer, right? He, uh, there's a whole bunch of people who we talk about in our book who are just sort of trying to pretend to do astronomy and don't really know the data. But ARP was, a, was the real deal. There are various very interesting bits of the universe named after him because he found them. Uh, one of the things he started claiming was that he had found these anomalous redshifts. So he was looking at a galaxy, just an ordinary galaxy, and you can measure the redshift of that galaxy. But through the galaxy or in the galaxy, it's kind of hard to tell, right? Because we just see, we can't look around the side of the galaxy to see, right? In the galaxy, as we see it on the night sky, there was also a quasar. And uh, the redshift of the quasar was much higher than the redshift of the galaxy. Now, um, if in, on the standard big, big Bang picture, what has to be happening is that the galaxy is in the foreground and the quasar is just way behind it. Right, I'll, do, I'll go this way. There's, there's the galaxy and there's just a quasar way behind it, which just happens to be shining through the galaxy. And so we just see two things. They're close together as we look at them, but they're not actually right on top of each other. And what Arp said was um, the probability of that is too small. Though you would just have them line up this perfectly. And he had multiple examples of this sort of thing, including ones where it wasn't quite going through the galaxy, but you had a galaxy here and then an object here. And then as you zoomed in, there seemed to be some sort of bridge between them, some sort of connection there between these, these, these objects. And so this was the anomalous redshift uh, claim that there must be something wrong if, if, the, if it really is the case that there's a galaxy out there with a quasar in it, and they're actually at the same distance, but they have massively distant, different redshifts, something's really gone wrong with the standard Big Bang story about how uh, redshifts happen, according to Harp. Arp, sorry. Um, but, but then there's actually a very interesting um, thing here, bias. We're, that's what we're, we're talking about. So I said, Halton Arp, um, who, who has died, he died a few years ago. Um, he was doing this work back in the 1950s, 60s, 60s? Yeah, maybe 70s. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as you said, he had this situation where he was looking at galaxies and he was finding these galaxies and finding quasars near them and saying, oh, they looked, looks like there was some physical connection. They had very, very different redshifts. And then there was some sort of statistical argument about how this is unexpected. Yeah. Right. And I remember um, talking to my old PhD supervisor, Mike Irwin, about, about all of this, about this notion of a priori versus a posteriori. Very good. Statistics. Right. right. So, so the example that, that he gave was uh, when we spoke about ARP quite a bit, is that you're playing golf mm -hmm. and line up the golf ball, whoosh, down the field it goes. Boom, lands on a, on a blade of grass and you walk over and you just say, what was the chances that it would hit that <laughs> blade of grass? Yeah. Right? Out of all the grass in all the field, why that blade of grass? And you're doing your statistics wrong, right? At that point, you're doing, you're, you're analyzing the system after the fact, right? Because you picked on that one and asked, look at that, one in 50 trillion. Whereas you should have asked the question, hitting the ball, what is the chances that the ball is going to end up on a blade of grass, which are completely different statistical questions. And Arp had this issue uh, with his statistics about um, quasars and galaxies and being along the line of sight to one another, etc. 
he was analyzing the systems he found afterwards, not in terms of asking the question beforehand. Right. Right. So anyway, that was just an aside. Um, and I just want to talk about golf because I hate it. I was a televised sky, <laughs> but back to the story. Back to the story. The other part of this story that, that is interesting to me is, is let's just assume. So there's all sorts of websites out there which say things like, you know, if, if Big Bang theorists took this seriously, uh, you know, this, you know, if cosmologists took this seriously, this would be the end of the Big Bang theory. Basically, it's disproved. And there's actually a really neat little logical error there. Uh, um, so here's the problem. Let's suppose that, that they're correct, right? Um, that there is in fact a galaxy out there and, in the, and somewhere in that galaxy at the same place, there is a quasar and they have extremely different redshifts. Um, what would that actually tell us? Well, it would tell us that uh, at least one of those redshifts doesn't indicate distance. That's what it would have to tell us. But it wouldn't tell us that both of those redshifts can't indicate distance. And in particular, when we think about um, the Hubble law, this relationship between the distance and the redshift, the way that we establish that law is via galaxies. So there's a distance ladder where we go through each step. Again, you can consult the book um, about how we measure things out into the universe. But it's crucial as a part of that, that we're considering galaxies, we're considering stars, we're considering the parallax distance to stars, we're considering the distance to Cepheid variable stars, we're considering the distance to um, uh, supernova, which are exploding stars, and those exist in galaxies. So when we establish the law, we do it with galaxies. Once the law is established, we can then assume the law and use the law on, on things that we can't actually directly measure the distance to. And that's what we're doing with quasars. We have not tested the Hubble law for quasars in the same sort of direct way that we've done it for, for galaxies. And so at most, if Harp was right about that quasar being in the galaxy, what it would mean is that actually quasars have a, have a, um, have a redshift which is not due to the expansion. That's all it would tell us. All it's telling us is that actually the redshift we see when we see the redshift of quasar is not the expansion of space. It has some other cause, but that's perfectly fine. What the Big Bang theory claims is if light comes to us from a certain distance in the universe, then it will be redshifted by this amount because of the expansion. What it does not say, and this is the logical error, is the, the converse of that. If you, if you turn the, the logical arrow the other way around, it's not saying if you see a redshift of a certain amount, it must have come from this far away in the universe. That's not true because there's other forms of redshift. There's gravitational redshift. There's just ordinary motion. If you are, we work this out, it works this out in the book. If you're driving at you know, 120 kilometers an hour and, and the, uh, uh, the police officer uh, gets their speed gun and measures your speed, uh, they're using the redshift of the light. They're using a difference in the Doppler shift of the light. But that doesn't mean that you're expanding with the universe and you, you couldn't use that as an argument to get out of the speed limit. Uh, and so what, what the critic wants to say is, assuming that that scenario is correct, is that if, um, if the quasar is at this distance but has a different redshift, then that's a, a failure of the prediction of the Hubble law, but that's getting it wrong. Okay, it, it, all it says is that there's another form of redshift there for quasars. All it would mean is not that the expanding universe is wrong because we established that on the ba basis of galaxies. All it would mean is that actually we don't understand quasars. There's something so, weird going on there. And, and in fact, uh, a lot of people that love ARP stuff have already suggested that quasars are ejected from galaxies at high yes. speed. And so they have proposed a mechanism to give the quasars their high redshift 
which preserves all the galaxy redshifts as being cosmological. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so it, is, it is a bizarre situation where people basically have provided the solution and still say that the expanding space picture is wrong. Yeah, it, it just in no way touches the evidence of the galaxies. And in particular, with quasars, you could at least imagine there was something weird going on which gave it an, a, a, a redshift we hadn't thought of. They're weird objects anyway. Even in the standard model, it's, you know, an accretion disk around a, a black hole and stuff is swirling around. All sorts of crazy stuff's going on there. With the galaxies, when we look at it, the outskirts of a galaxy, we're just seeing stars. And we know that because we can just look at them. There's nothing that weird going on. They just look like the sun, but further away. Or, you know, the things we see around us, but further away. There's no... It's very hard to imagine, and none of these people who make this objection come up with a scenario where they imagine how this thing got so much redshift uh, in spite of just being an ordinary star out there in the universe and not with, in, a, in a, a space that's not ex expanding. So this is why, in fact, anomalous redshifts, even, even with the slightly uh, at least questionable statistics of, of whether they are anomalous or not, and we're not allowing that for a second, uh, even if even if all these claims were right, it wouldn't touch the Big Bang theory. But there's a nice little little test with the Lyman Alpha Forest of trying to work out whether our picture of galaxies and quasars redshifts, whether those at least fit together. We can look at things that the quasar shows us in absorption, clouds of neutral hydrogen, right? Which which if we understand those, it has to be from you know we have to understand quasar redshifts to understand that. And then look at galaxy redshifts and see whether they are actually correlated with each other. Because if they have a totally different physical source, those two things could be anywhere in the universe. But if they're both because of expansion, they'd be in the same place and we'd see a correlation. And that's exactly what we do see. So uh, sort of a failure on all counts here from an anomalous redshifts. So anomalous redshifts are not going to revolutionize cosmology. Yes, if you are a cosmic revolutionary and you're reading our handbook as to how to do this right, that's not the way to go.